Hello and welcome to this little um, webinar on tongue tie and myofunctional therapy. My name is Shirley Gutkowski. I'm a myofunctional therapist um, who started out as a dental hygienist and um, I am part owner of Primal Air. We have our physical location in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, but we see about 60% of our clients virtually, so I'm open to anywhere in the country. So this webinar is going to be about how did we get here, why are there so many ties, and why do you need to see a myofunctional therapist as part of your team to um, help you overcome the limits of a tongue tie. So this is the mouth. This is um, kind of what we look at. We have the teeth, as you see. We have the tongue. We have the uvula down in the middle. And we have tonsils on either side. And the blacker areas, that's your airway. And when we look as a dental professional in your mouth, we're looking at your throat. And up until recently, we didn't know that we were, well, we knew we were looking at the airway, but we always called it a throat and didn't really put the two together. So when we're looking in the throat, we're looking for how much room there is for the air to go through. And you can see in the class four pictures in both of these diagrams, there's almost no visual airway at all. So as a dental professional, we used to look at people with a class four and say, oh my gosh, I wish they would just have their tongue behave. But this is not a behavioral problem. We can't see back there when your tongue is lifted that high. It could be that your tongue is lifted or it could be that your soft palate is down or a combination of those. But mostly when we see this kind of a situation with these new eyes of a myofunctional therapist, we are looking at a condition where the posterior part of the tongue, the last third of the tongue, has not... Um, lifted, has not been activated. We look at the tonsils if we can see them. <laughs> and um, I, a lot of times we'll see that the tonsils are coming together. We're looking at the uvula to see if that shows any sign of sleep disordered breathing like snoring. And often we'll see a uvula that's pretty big. It's been vibrating all night long, so it's just got exercised and beefed up. And when we're looking at the airway on x-rays, we don't usually take x-rays. We get them usually from the referring physician or dentist. We're looking to see the airway. We're looking to see if we see any soft tissue, um, soft tissue obstructions like the adenoids or the tonsils. And we're looking to see how big this hollow like in the first picture, this hollow tube is, and to make sure that um, we have access to the airway at all. And when I'm looking at this, I'm also very distracted by the neck and the curve of the neck. You can see almost all of these pictures here. I had to draw in the black line of how the neck should curve, and it doesn't in these people with airway problems. And um, it can be that way for a number of different reasons, but often it's because there's a tongue tie. The tongue tie interferes with that cervical curve. So if you've been seeing a chiropractor to get rid of your curve, it could be because the tie is interfering with all of that. This is a these are pictures of what you would imagine a classical tie would be. Now I'd like to point out to you that almost all of these people have adult teeth. So these tongue ties have been seen by a dentist in the past and a physician in the past and never identified as being a problem. This is the level of tolerance that we have for tongue ties. This is why all of a sudden everybody has a tongue tie, even old people. So um, when I was a child, this was just looked at by a dentist. And even our education as dental hygienists, I graduated in 1986, and it was just a matter of can you talk, can you eat. And it's very common that a person could fall when they're two or three years old and rip that tissue. That for sure doesn't happen. So we just look at this and say, well, you can talk and you can eat. And we didn't really have a good appreciation for what 
kind of problems there would be associated with a tongue tie, which we do today. So this first um, row of pictures here is just your regular attachment. The second row, the attachment is very close to the tip of the tongue. So this would be a short blade. And then the bottom pictures, the bottom row of pictures, is that the frenum is very short. So it doesn't allow that tongue to lift up. Or it might be that it's forward and short. Sometimes you'll hear about people commenting on a Eiffel Tower look, like a couple of them here in the lower um, row. And that is because the tie, the, the attachment, is too far forward and it's attached to the tissue that's surrounding the bone holding the lower teeth in. So this is one of the top things that we can do in a dental practice to check for tongue tie. We ask that you open your mouth as far as you can and then lift your tongue to the spot right behind your upper front teeth. And when you do that, the mouth should not close more than 50% of the way. So you can see this person has uh, a mouth opening that doesn't close more than 50%. So technically speaking, that would be okay. As a myofunctional therapist, I would still look at that second picture and evaluate the function of the tongue because it still doesn't look really good. And I'd like to draw your attention to that first picture and see that the airway is visible but the tongue is crooked back there. So that could be a feature of a vagus nerve dysfunction or a couple of other things. So those are all things that we look at in myofunctional therapy. Now if you look at this person, you can see that their mouth is not closing more than 50% of the way, except that the entire floor of the mouth is lifted up over the biting surface of surface of those lower molars. So this is a tongue tie even though the mouth can open. If I put my finger on that um, frenum, that's what that little tissue is called, and held the floor of the mouth down, that person would not be able to open their mouth past the size of my finger. I'd also draw your attention to the nostrils and notice that the nostrils are very, very small and that this person probably has been mouth breathing their entire life. So I'd like to invite you to send me a picture of your tongue in this suction maneuver. So if you think of um, making the sound of horse's hooves or a tick-tock, remember from when you were three or four? So this sound and then just suck your tongue up and not do the sound part and suck your tongue all the way up to your palate. This is one thing that I ask of my patients, my virtual patients for sure, to send me clear photos of what their tongue looks like in different postures and this is one. And you can see this one here, you can barely see the frenum at all because it's buried in the, in the muscle. And if you send that, send me your picture to what's using the WhatsApp app, it's um, encrypted both ways so we can communicate about your pictures. So this person here is um, being measured for their maximum opening and their maximum opening with their tongue to the spot. So this person cannot reach their middle third of their tongue up to the palate. And the mouth is closed very, very too much actually. So you can see that the measurement is in the wrong place. This measuring device is um, not at the edge of the tooth where it should be. Let's see if I can get that. So there we go. It should be right here. So by having it between the teeth, you can see you're going to get a improper reading. So this reading is maybe only 28 or 30 millimeters. So this person here, you can see it's at the mouth opening is at 40, it's at 50 millimeters. And then with the tongue up to the spot, it's only about 22 millimeters. 
So that's um, a pretty decent tongue tie. We also ask our patients to move their tongue from side to side and send us a photo of um, the tongue to the right and tongue to the left. You can see that divot in the top of the tongue and that would indicate a, a restriction from the bottom. Sometimes with this photo we can also see that there's a restriction down here. This picture doesn't show it very clearly but um, that's that's an indication that something's happening. So if you look at the tongue in this kind of a section, so this is cut down the down the middle from front to back. So they cut the whole front of the tongue off, let's say, and we're looking at it. And we can see that we've got these muscles here. We have a fibrous septum here between the two halves of the tongue. We have um, other muscles here. We have the genioglossus muscle, which is pretty big right here. Um, we have these outside muscles here, the hyoglossus muscle and uh, some other myohyoid muscle, uh, myohyoid muscle, as well as a styohyoid hyoid muscle. Ugh, my tongue's not working. That goes kind of to the, almost to the ear canal. So we've got all of these muscles here, and we need for those muscles to be free and not be attached to one another. And that's what happens with these tongue ties. So imagine you you saw the tongue tie, right, as a, as a soft tissue in those pictures, but imagine it's in the middle of the tongue where you can't see it. So it's attaching these muscles together in a weird way, and that's sometimes where, where you'll see a divot. And that's where you're going to see um, a problem with the functioning of the tongue. And that's why it needs to be released. So this is the underside of the tongue, and this is some more um, anatomy for you to kind of get an idea and have a conversation with others. The blade of the tongue is from where the frenum attaches to the tip of the tongue. So it should be, according to Kotlow, over 16 millimeters. So if you can get that thing measured, good luck. <laughs> it should be greater than 16 millimeters long. And then there's the frenum that attaches from under the tongue to the floor of the mouth and that's those are the two things we measure and then we divide the tongue into thirds we have an anterior third which is the front the middle third and then the posterior third which is the back third of the tongue if the tongue cannot reach up into the palate from childhood on it doesn't allow that arch to grow. It doesn't expand the arch and you end up with a high narrow arch. You'll call it, uh, sometimes you'll hear it called a vaulted arch or a high narrow arch or some other kind of terminology but that's what's, what it means is that it's very narrow and it's too tall and that interferes with the sinuses because the sinuses are on the exact other side of that. Now the spot seems to be a very elusive thing to find. It is not right behind your upper front teeth. It is behind behind your upper front teeth. So if you'll use your tongue right now and put it behind your upper front teeth and just get tuned into what it feels like. So just the tip behind your upper front teeth. Now slowly t drag your tongue backwards a little bit. And just before it falls into the the other part of the palate, stop and then widen your tongue a little bit and suddenly you're going to feel two ovals, um, one on either side of that middle. And that's technically the spot. So I'll repeat it one more time because not everybody gets it. So put your tongue behind your upper front teeth, the tip of your tongue. Slowly, without too much pressure, drag it backwards before it falls into the upper part of the palate there. Kind of stop and spread out the tip. And you, that's, where the, that's where the spot is. So what do we do? We do a lot of different things and most of them are 
simple exercises that we use from the, what I call the molar protocol and we offer different um, different series of exercises every week or every few weeks in order to get your muscles to be active in the right way so you can see that center picture is moving I don't know why the other pictures aren't moving Some of the exercises need a little bit of equipment. Some of them don't. Your tongue, you exercise your tongue. Some of the exercises are just to stimulate your tongue and activate different um, neurology in the tongue. So that's how that goes. So at Primal Air, that's what we do. We do it virtually and in person. And our mission was to bring families together. Um, we know a lot of families where the spouses sleep in separate rooms. Um, some people build on an extra room onto their house so the snorer has a place that they can sleep um, because it's just a problem. But it's not just a thing of noise. It's improper sleep and improper airway and this was what happened in our house we had five children my husband and I we had a kid who had those little black circles under his eyes he had asthma our first son thought, fought sleep like I've never seen before or since he hated sleeping so bad and our fourth son was a thumb sucker and he was always had his thumb in his mouth even when we brought him home from the hospital I put a little sock on his hand and he screamed and screamed and screamed until I took that thing off because he needed to have the thumb in there and what we know now is that the thumb kind of helped um, stimulate some neurology and it also kind of held the tongue out of the way so that he could breathe a little easier so by 1987 we recognized that two of our kids had asthma they all were bedwetters, all five of them, and it was not pleasant. And we ended up finally getting almost, I think all five of them ended up with some kind of a nasal spray medication. And then because they already were sleep deprived and their executive function never fully developed because of their um, sleep problems that were unidentified, um, they had a lot of problems in school. We had the police calls every day or the school called every day on our answering machine. Remember those? One of our sons had lymphoma and today two of our sons have adult onset type 1 diabetes. And we know that sleep, deprive, sleep deprivation and um, and improper breathing contribute to glucose problems in the body so if you're having glucose problems in your body you you can imagine how your pancreas can get burned out and so at the age of 23 and at the age of 36 I think it was type 1 diabetes so their pancreas just shut off did I just say that their sleep caused type 1 diabetes no what I'm saying is that um, it contributed to it. So yeah, there we go. We have uh, two kids with diabetes. We have a kid with rheumatoid arthritis. And in 2014, I learned that a lot of their problems, their health problems, came from their airway. And now that I'm really taking a good deep hard look at epigenetics, I can see where some of these problems came because of, surprisingly enough, World War II. So <clears throat> that's a conversation for a different webinar. So we're going to just keep moving along here on, on airway and a little bit of epigenetics and how we've seen changes globally on the shape of the face that were unrecognized up until not too long ago. There were a couple of um, doctors that kind of alerted us to all of these problems just before World War II broke out and then again a little bit afterwards. So <clears throat> we'll talk about them in just a second because they really are early 
warning signs that there's something happening here. So I'm sorry for the swear word on there, but this is Dr. Kevin Boyd's <laughs> slide, and this is what got his ire up. He has a master's degree in human dentition, and he's a pediatric dentist, so he's pretty well educated in all of this kind of stuff. And he challenged this idea that babies are born with retrognathia. And he's like, this just doesn't happen. There's no reason why the chin should be back. It doesn't interfere with birthing at all, ever, which is what they're saying is the co or the reason why the chin is back set back so far. And in current times, in the United States, the chin is set back, and there's no real archaeological pathway for that to happen. So evolutionarily speaking, this change happened far too quickly. And that this reduction in the chin, and we'd only talk about the chin because it's so obvious, but the maxilla is also much smaller. So when Dr. Boyd did a, a study on pre-industrial fetal skulls at uh, Penn Museum, and he also traveled to archaeological kind of digs across the, uh, across the globe, he found over and over again that pre-industrial times, so before the 1850s or so, the skulls of infants, newborns, and fetal, fetuses were not recessed back and that the change is a very very recent dramatic change so this is what the chin looked like in prehistoric times or pre-industrial times and today we see this kind of an angle on the chins of these babies so now they're forced to um, they're forced to mouth breathe and it makes nursing almost impossible for some of these kids. This one in particular, the chin is so far back. Some of this comes because of the way that we process the food. So even starting out as tiny babies and little, little kids, we're giving them highly processed foods. So these are very popular. Gerber is a great name in baby care but their idea of what is going to be healthful for children has not been keeping up with the times. So these pouches are very detrimental to the shape of the face. And putting these very fructose high foods into those pouches is contributing to this insulin resistance that we're seeing today. And then we get to a certain stage where we don't know the difference between what's food and what's just something to eat. And we, we have a very, very high tolerance for fast food. If you went to fast food only on the 15th of every month and you never went to it any other time during the month, probably none of this stuff would happen. But it's so easy to do it over and over and over again. It's handy. We're busy. We're all working. We have to do better because epigenetically speaking, we are seeing dramatic changes and that the lack of chewing has also been contributing to this smaller and smaller face. Dr. Mew talks about chewing gum. He has his four-year-old patients chew gum for one hour a day, not the same hour, so it's in little smaller increments throughout the day just to get the face to activate and grow. These smoothies and this whole idea of you can just drink your your nutrition has really been incredibly damaging as well. We're probably on our second generation of smoothies right now and juicing and uh, it's not it's not healthful. You need to chew. You cannot drink a salad and get all of the things you need from a salad out of a glass. You need to incorporate the chewing. We know that pediatric obstructive sleep apnea is a condition of facial 
growth, of stunted facial growth. One way to, to stop that is to chew. One way to keep on doing that is to keep drinking everything. And your the, the offspring are going to be having smaller and smaller faces. So this is, uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this or not, but this is a video that I stole from, I think it was Facebook. Well, it must have been YouTube because I don't know how to steal pictures from Facebook yet. <laughs> This is a two-year-old boy. You can just see how much struggle he has with breathing and how he just stops breathing because he can't get it all together. So they went a surgical route with him and had his tonsils and adenoids removed, but he's still not breathing right. His mouth is still open. And we know that today uh, too many kids relapse after having their tonsils and adenoids removed. He still needs help with breathing. Mouth breathing does cause different shapes of the face and that comes because the tongue is not engaged with the palate. This was a patient of mine who had an open bite and she has a she had a lot of trouble um, getting it together to get her nasal breather breathing going. We have a lot of studies to show that depending on how you compensate for not being able to breathe through your nose makes your teeth all kinds of crooked. We also know that mouth breathing interferes with the growth of the sinuses. So we need to make sure that all of our kids are breathing through their nose exclusively. If their tongue is tied, it makes it harder to breathe through the nose because the tongue has to press up against the palate in order to grow the sinuses. So imagine if your first two years of life you're breathing with your mouth open, your palate just never gets wide enough so now you're three and now you have the sinus size of a seven month old let's say and you're three and you're trying to run around and be three years old and get into trouble and climb and all of that kind of stuff you're forced to breathe through your nose now so it's really really critical that we get to these problems as early as possible we also know that kids who have open mouth postures and breathe through their mouth overnight have a lower pH in their mouth which contributes to increases in biofilm production because biofilm loves a low pH and that biofilm is usually filled with cavity causing bacteria or bacteria that cause gum disease. So we need to get these kids to sleep with their mouth closed. We have to remember that the evidence is still accumulating and that the very bottom part, even though it's the bottom part, it's not even the bottom, it's like the second or third rung up um, on the evidence-based pyramid. So that's what we're supposed to use, right, is evidence-based practice. But we have to remember that the first or first or second rung of that thing is clinical experience and patients' values and preferences along with the best research evidence. This was, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is a mother who, um, whose baby cut their two front teeth and uh, he's grinding his teeth all the time. And she's wondering what the heck, because the dentists are very tolerant of tooth grinding in children too, because we've never had an answer. We were always like, well, it's common, whatever. They'll grow out of it. So this next person, though, responded that her middle son ground his teeth frequently before he had his tongue tie released. The grinding of the teeth is a sign that there's an airway problem. And during your sleep time especially, you grind your teeth so that you stay awake and don't fall into that deeper, deeper sleep where you become paralyzed. We have to get better about the food that we eat. We have to chew the food. We have to eat food that contain fats. We have to really get with the program here. That We're at a critical time. Dr. Weston Price in the early 1900s had a 
practice, a dental practice, and he started to see all these crooked teeth showing up, and he was wondering what the heck is going on, and eventually he sold his entire practice and started studying primitive people around the world in these um, sequestered communities. What he found out there were straight, beautiful, strong teeth with very few areas of decay. They had strong, healthy bodies that were resistant to disease. And they had the emotional stability because they had an adherence to a, to a traditional diet. Now, these traditional diets were local diets. They were ancestral diets to that group of people. They did not get food trucked in. Even though it was fresh vegetables, they didn't come from two, 3,000 miles away. They ate locally and they ate with their ancestral diet. Today, in the United States, people have to decide between what food is good for the body or what they can afford. So it's really hard right there now. But we don't have a good appreciation for what is food and what is something to eat. This was a global article that was published a couple of years ago and it asked people around the world, please show us a picture of a week's worth of groceries of the food that you eat in a, in a month. Must be a month for $400, $500. But when you look at this picture of the Americans, you have to wonder what the heck is happening. They have a little bit of vegetables here. There's a couple of tomatoes. Is that lettuce? It's, it's hard to say. Some grapes this is it. That's the only food they eat. Everything else is highly processed. How would they even put these in here? I don't know. All the soda and bottled foods and all this cans of soda back here. Oh, here's some fresh meat. So in your mind, what percentage of this food is food and what percentage is something to eat? I'm just going to leave that up to you. I'm not going to do all the calculations. But of that huge bill for food, they're not getting what they want. We have to see that we have actual food deserts in the United States where people don't have access to food. They have access to something to eat. And we have a problem with food insecurity where they don't know where their next meal is going to be coming from or how they're going to afford it or if they can walk to the grocery store or take a bus or they have to take a cab because they don't have a car. And this is a map of um, car-free households more than a mile from a grocery store. Those kind of things are also being studied. And you can see that the people here in the lower left where they have the highest concentration of more than a mile from a grocery store with no car and adult obesity up here in this pinky purple map and the diabetes numbers are all very similar to where these food insecurity and food deserts are. And we have to really also think, too, that it's difficult to get people to understand something when their salary depends on not understanding it. That is a, such a key comment um, that I'm surprised that we don't talk about it more this way. Uh, Upton Sinclair is not a contemporary. This has been going on a long time, and that's how we got here. There, was, there were influences that had to do with, with products and money. On the one hand, companies give us the food that we're asking for. That's why we have those 100 calorie packs. That's why we have, you know, fat free, sugar free, blah, blah, blah. Everything's free. It's like little cardboard chips. We have that segment, but we also have a segment that says we have too much grain. We need to get people to eat all this grain. It's going bad on us. The farmers are going broke because the grain prices are too low. So let's get people to eat more grain instead of let's get farmers to grow something else. So myofunctional therapy, eliminating these tongue ties, 
getting breathing better, reducing sleep apnea, reducing poor breathing in children is to me the first domino in healthcare. And we need to get in front of that first domino. And think of myofunctional therapy as yoga for the face. We just ask you to move your face around. We move, we work with the muscles in the snoring complex to get them harmonized. And we don't want to have to have kids on pills. We want them to chew. And the more they chew and the better food that they eat, the better off everyone's going to be. Learning will be better. Everything will be better. And at Primal Air, we really are, our goal is really to remove family stress. So thank you for your time today. I hope this was helpful in understanding what it is that myofunctional therapists do, sort of, and why we're in a situation now where we have so many tongue ties and why it seems like everybody in the world all of a sudden has a tongue tie when it kind of is that way. <laughs> and what solutions we have available to us today to um, eliminate that. Feel free to give us a call. Feel free to email us. Um, I can do another little video here on what's a good photograph to send me for the virtual appointments um, so that we can get you and your family back together, sleeping together, improve your children's executive function, um, improve the airway, so I guess we would re improve the airway and then that would affect the, <laughs> I don't want you to think that I'm a neurologist or trying to be a neurologist, but that's, you know, it's just kind of how it all flows together and how it all happens. So thanks again. Give us a call, give us an email, and you can also go to our Facebook page right here on Facebook book and uh, communicate that way. Might be a little bit slow because we're not used to doing the Facebook communication as much as email and phone. So thanks again. This is Shirley Gutkowski signing off.